Hello all, welcome to this video. Here we will be talking about one half of the fatty acid metabolism that is the synthesis of fatty acids. Specifically, we will be talking about the biosynthesis of palmitic acid. Now there are two types of fatty acids. Those are the saturated ones and the unsaturated ones. Saturated ones are the fatty acids which do not have any double bond between the carbon atoms as you can see over here whereas unsaturated fatty acids can have one or more than one double bonds. So palmitic acid is an example of a saturated fatty acid and we are going to talk about how this fatty acid is being synthesized in the cell. Now one thing to note is that the mechanism of saturated uh, fatty acid synthesis is quite conserved between the prokaryotes as well as the eukaryotes though the catalytic domains the entities are arranged differently we will see what is their main enzyme that is involved. So it is arranged differently the, it's not together but then essentially the process remains the same in prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes. But the fatty acid synthesis is not an exact reversal of fatty acid breakdown it's not just the you know a simple opposite of fatty acid breakdown in fact it's quite energetically expensive and the acetyl coa is what acts as a precursor so we'll see what are the key you know players that are there in this fatty acid synthesis and we'll also see where it occurs now the key ingredients like i said are the acetyl coa which is a two carbon molecule malonyl coa which is a three carbon molecule now malonyl coa please note that it come it is modified from or it comes from it is derived from an acetyl coa so you do get malonyl coa from acetyl coa itself that is acetyl coa is being added with one carbon dioxide and that's how you get malonyl coa and then these two are the main players but it's only the methyl end of the carbon chain in fatty acid which comes from acetyl coa this is going to contribute only to the methyl end all the other carbons that are there in a fatty acid are coming from malonyl coa so that's why both of them have been listed out as the precursors not just that we need a really important ingredient apart from the enzymes of course a very important ingredient that is involved in fatty acid synthesis is NADPH now NADPH is a reducing agent we all know it it stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate now NADPH is a reducing agent which mainly comes from the pentose phosphate pathway also called as the hexose monophosphate shunt you can see the video for it over here that's a very important pathway in the cell through which we get NADPH that is the main pathway through which we get the molecule NADPH the other step is now what we will be talking about that is by the action of the enzyme called as malic enzyme. So malic enzyme also helps us to get a reasonable amount of NADPH. So where does it occur? Now the occurrence is seen in the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells, uh, I would say animal cells is where the fatty acid synthesis occurs. It can also occur in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So we will see what is the difference between the fatty acid synthesis that occurs in endoplasmic reticulum and the one that happens in cytoplasm. This we will see towards the end of the video. In plant cells, this happens mainly in the chloroplasts. So in animal cells, usually it occurs in the liver cells. 42% of the you know, new fatty acids are formed in the liver. Other than that, it can happen in the white adipose tissue, but you can have it in any cell's cytoplasm. However, in a plant cell, it can only be seen in a chloroplast. And a bacterial cell or a prokaryotic cell, of course, does not have any organelles. So all of these steps, the fatty acid synthesis steps, occur only in the cytoplasm. Now when does this fatty acid synthesis take place? So when the blood glucose levels are high or you can say that when the person is in a fed state, fed state that means the person is eating or sort of absorbing food. So when the person is in a fed state or when their blood glucose levels are high that is what triggers the fatty acid synthesis. Not only that even when the cellular ATP is high that also helps in initiating or triggering 
the fatty acid synthesis so you know this is like a sort of indication by the body that we already have a high amount of atp we already have a lot of energy in the cell so let's stop breaking down things and let's start synthesizing new things so that we can store the energy that is the whole point of you know that's how the energy or atp is regulating synthesis of molecules because it's a mechanism to store the energy so these are the conditions under which we have the occurrence of fatty acid synthesis in a cell now the first part is to generate our precursors that is the acetyl coa malonyl coa and nadph now what i have shown you here is the entry of glucose into the cell that is it is the what is drawn over here is the cell and this particular organelle is the mitochondria so glucose is taken up into the cell getting it gets converted to pyruvate by the process of emp pathway or any other glycolytic pathway and that pyruvate enters inside the mitochondria for taking part in the tca cycle or the citric acid cycle now that pyruvate gets decarboxylated to form acetyl coa which is a two carbon compound so acetyl coa is being formed inside the mitochondria now acetyl coa combines with oxaloacetic acid or oxaloacetate to form citrate so here we have a two carbon compound combining with a four carbon compound to form a six carbon compound that is citric acid or isocitrate citric acid then goes to form isocitrate or isocitric acid which goes to form alpha ketoglutarate and then through a series of steps are we get back our oxaloacetate and this is what we call as a citric acid cycle or the tca cycle but this is not what we are going to concentrate on now what happens here is this isocitrate is getting converted to alpha ketoglutarate by an enzyme called as isocitrate dehydrogenase so let's see that step those two steps in detail isocitrate dehydrogenase is the enzyme which is going to convert isocitrate or isocitric acid into alpha ketoglutaric acid which is a phi carbon compound so basically we have decarboxylation over there it's an oxidative decarboxylation step now that enzyme is allosterically inhibited by atp what does that mean it means that when the atp levels are high in a cell the isocitrate starts building up why because now this enzyme has been inhibited by atp so when the isocitrate starts building up in the cell automatically by reversible reaction if you see over here isocitrate and citrate are you know converted to each other they are just isomers so that's a reversible reaction and by this reversible reaction we also have citrate building up inside the cell so now isocitrate was more due to the high atp which inhibited that particular enzyme and because of that citrate levels also went up now citrate is capable of being transported across or it is able to move across the mitochondrial membrane with the help of a citrate transporter so citrate which was now building up inside the mitochondria reaches outside into the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm it is acted upon by an important enzyme called as citrate lyase now citrate lyase breaks down this six carbon compound of that is citrate into a four carbon compound that is oxaloacetate and a two carbon compound that is acetyl coa so we get back whatever happened inside the inside the mitochondria it's the exact opposite that's happening over here with the help of an enzyme that's called as citrate lyase so citrate lyase is helping us to get back our oxaloacetate and acetyl coa now acetyl coa gets carboxylated acetyl coa gets added with one carbon dioxide by the very 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 important enzyme that's called as acetyl coa carboxylase also abbreviated as acc so acetyl coa carboxylase carboxylates the two carbon acetyl coa to form a three carbon compound that is malonyl coa so we have already got our for you know the one of the precursors over here on the other hand now what happens so we'll talk about the regulation of acc enzyme in the next slide but then let's see what happens to our oxaloacetate oxaloacetate gives us malate and malate here there's no removal of carbon dioxide even malate is a four carbon compound and malate then gives us pyruvate by the malic enzyme which is basically a redox reaction so what happens here is we have the formation of nadph so nadp plus gets or accepts hydrogen to form nadph so nadp is getting reduced and malate is getting oxidized to form pyruvate malate is a four carbon compound whereas pyruvate is a three carbon compound so essentially here you are having decarboxylation as well you are having the removal of carbon dioxide as well so this is catalyzed by the enzyme that's called as malic enzyme also called as malate dehydrogenase now 
what all have we got? We have got all three of our precursors. Why is that? We have got NADPH, we have got malonyl CoA, and we also get acetyl CoA. Now, how does acetyl CoA, how do we get acetyl CoA? So, some of the acetyl CoA gets converted into malonyl CoA, whereas some of the acetyl CoA remains as such. Not just that, not just that. If acetyl CoA starts accumulating within the mitochondrial matrix, if it starts accumulating over there, then it can combine with the transporter protein that's called as carnitin and it can be transported into the cytoplasm as well. So I do get acetyl CoA directly from the mitochondrial matrix or I can have some of the acetyl CoA remaining as such and not getting converted to malonyl CoA in the end giving me all three of my main ingredients that is malonyl CoA, acetyl CoA and NADPH. So this is the first part where we have just got the ingredients. Now one thing to remember here is that this step where we have the ACC enzyme that is the, uh, the acetyl CoA carboxylase enzyme which is carboxylating acetyl CoA. This enzyme is called as or that step is what we call as the commitment step. Commitment step is basically the step you know which is now ensuring that fatty acid synthesis will occur. Why is that? It's because malonyl CoA does not have any other metabolic role in our cell. So once malonyl CoA is formed, our cell knows that this has to eventually give me a fatty acid. That's the only job it has. So that's why this step is called as the commitment step. And in this step, please note, there is use of ATP. That means ATP is being broken down or we are using energy in this particular step. So acetyl CoA carboxylase is a very, very important enzyme which usually you know, is associated or requires biotin and this enzyme decides whether the fatty acid synthesis is going to continue or not. If this step occurs, it means now the cell is committed to forming fatty acids. So this is what we have seen right now. We've just seen the citrate shuttle. So citrate is being shuttled out, being converted into oxaloacetic acid and also it gives us the acetyl CoA which then finally gives us the malonyl CoA. Oxaloacetic acid which is formed over here eventually gives us the NADPA. So these precursor forming job or the, or the whole role of forming precursors is what we have done till now. Now the ACC enzyme, ACC is acetyl CoA carboxylase. This enzyme is the, you know, the only regulatory enzyme in the entire fatty acid synthesis. So you need, that's why, it's, that's a, another reason why we call it as the commitment step. If you turn on this enzyme, the whole process is turned on. If you turn off this enzyme, the whole process is turned off. So this is a really important enzyme which decides the direction of fatty acid synthesis. This enzyme can be regulated in two ways. Either it can be regulated allosterically or with the help of hormones. So allosteric regulation is seen by, you know, it's, this enzyme is basically a dimer. Usually the ACC enzyme is a dimer and in the dimer it's in an inactive form. But then if there are some factors which are, you know, helping it or which are making it polymerize. If the, from the dimer form, if it goes into a polymerized form, it then becomes active. So if I say that there are some, uh, you know, hormones or if there are some um, initiators or some regulators which are promoting the ACC action, it means they are basically converting the dimer into polymer. And if I say that they are inhibiting the action of this enzyme, it means they are converting the polymer back into diver, dimer and thus they are stopping the whole process of fatty acid synthesis. So allosteric regulation, we see that citrate is one of the molecules which stimulates the enzyme. So if there's a lot of citrate, it means automatically there's a lot of, you know, uh, precursor available for us to form acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA. So automatically the enzyme is being upregulated or it is being stimulated. Palmitoyl CoA or in fact any long chain Fatty acid, a fatty acid which is having a CoA attached to it, a CoA group coenzyme A attached to it, that is inhibiting the whole process. The reason being, this is what we get from fatty acid oxidation. So if there's already a lot of oxidation happening, we are getting a lot of these, you know, fatty acid acyl CoA, we don't need to again synthesize new fatty acids. So palmitoyl CoA or any other long chain fatty acid which is having a CoA group attached to it, inhibits this process. When we see hormones, insulin is a hormone that 
stimulates the process because so if we go into the detail of the process here insulin is you know insulin goes and attaches or uh, it um, uh, helps to stimulate the phosphatases enzyme and phosphatases enzyme cause dephosphorylation of the active enzyme so they dephosphorylize the active enzyme and convert it from a polymer into a dimer on the other hand and hormones like cortisol or glucagon they go and stimulate a protein kinase a so protein kinase a phosphorylates the enzyme converts it in from dimer into polymer to cut the long story short the acetyl coa carboxylase is an enzyme which is regulated in the fatty acid synthesis the only regulatory enzyme and hence the regulation is really really important because this determines whether we are going to proceed with the fatty acid synthesis or not now the fatty acid synthesis i have been telling you it happens in the cytoplasm so in the cytoplasm we have another enzyme so the acc enzyme was one which was really important to decide whether this is going to occur or not the next important enzyme the enzyme which is actually going to take part in all the other steps of our fatty acid synthesis is fatty acid synthase enzyme now fatty acid synthase often also abbreviated as fas fatty acid synthase is a large multi enzyme complex which is found in the animals or plants or bacteria in fact in animals there are two subunits that are you know which have multiple enzyme activities whereas in plants and bacteria you don't have it as a large subunit and it is made up of individual enzymes but there the catalytic steps everything else is same it's just that they function independently that's all they are you know not present as a complex but in animals they are present as one big complex which is made up of seven different enzymes and a carrier protein so that carrier protein is called as acyl carrier protein or abbreviated as acp and then we have all the other seven enzymes which are combined together to form one big complex that is called as one big enzyme called as fatty acid synthase this is the enzyme which carries out the fatty acid synthesis so the chain has to you know grow we now only have the acetyl coa and the malonyl coa we need to form a long chain that's what is called as a fatty acid so that chain growth the elongation is being done by this fatty acid synthase enzyme there are different types we have type 1 in animals and fungi we have type 2 in plants bacteria archaea and these are the different domains that you can see in this picture these are the different domains the functional domains of this particular enzyme so it usually exists as a dimer that means two enzymes combine with each other but more than that what we need to know here is that there are two important components that are there in this fatty acid synthase enzyme which are which we will be you know visiting again and again during the fatty acid synthesis so that's the only reason i have highlighted these one is the cysteine residue which is having an active thiol group or you know you can see over here so the cysteine residue is one of the major players of this enzyme and the other one is the acyl carrier protein acyl carrier protein is attached to the enzyme in some cases like for example in bacteria it is a separate protein but then mostly in animals it is attached now this acyl carrier protein has a group on it again a sulfhydryl group on it which is the you know uh, uh, something that is similar a pantothenate group is there on the acyl carrier protein so acyl carrier protein is one end which is important to us and the other end which is important to us is the cysteine end so both of these are now going to hold our precursors what are our precursors acetyl coa and malonyl coa that's why i have highlighted these two but yes apart from this the entire enzyme complex is made up of different catalytic domains each one each catalytic take domain takes part in the each reaction so we'll see what each of the reactions are and please remember all of this is now happening in the cytoplasm of the cell so let's do step by step i've just showed you the enzyme over here just for us to understand better this is the cysteine residue with its sulfhydryl group this is the pantothenate residue of acp that is the acyl carrier protein with its sulfhydryl group now in the first step we have addition of the acetyl coa so what is shown over here is the acetyl coa we have addition of the acetyl coa to the acp end so you have addition of acetyl coa over here to the acp end by the enzyme acetyl transferase or in some books you will also find it as acetyl trans acetylase both are fine so we have acetyl group being transferred to the pantothenate group of acp so acetyl group comes and sits over here now once the acetyl group comes and sits to the acp end the next step is where the the acetyl group is transferred from the acetyl from the acp end to the cysteine end 
So it came and sat over here. It decides it's not very comfortable over here. It shifts there. So you have transfer of acetyl group from the pantothenate of the ACP end to the sulfahedral group of the cysteine end. So now the next step, you, that's what is shown over here. In the next step, we have acetyl ACP, which was bound to the ACP end, combining or transferring on to the FAS enzyme or the cysteine group of the FAS enzyme. So this is the FAS enzyme. And now we have the acetyl group coming and sitting over here. Now the moment acetyl group sat over there, now this pantothenate is free to take up our next precursor that is malonyl-CoA. So now we have malonyl-CoA combining with the ACP end to form what we now see over here that is the malonyl ACP. So this three carbon compound, this is the malonyl is bound to the ACP end whereas the acetyl group is bound to the FAS. Now FAS end or you know the cysteine uh, residue of the FAS enzyme. Now we are ready to start with the elongation and all the other work. So both our precursors have come and sat on the enzyme. Next step that we have is condensation. Condensation or it's also called as decarboxylation. It's mainly called as condensation because now we had two different precursors. We have mixed them together. We have joined them together. We have condensed them together. That's why it's called as condensation. So acetyl group is sitting on the cysteine end. Malonyl group is sitting on the ACP end. Now what happens here is we have the acetyl group from the cysteine end being picked up and being combined with the malonyl group which is there on the ACP end. But in this process, one carbon dioxide is being lost. So I had two carbons over here. I have three carbons over here in malonyl. But because one carbon dioxide gets lost, now I have a four carbon compound that is attached to the ACP end which is called as acetoacetyl group. So you can see in the equation that's happening over here, we have the acetyl group combining with the malonyl group which is attached to the ACP end, it all gets, you know, like you can say squished together or condensed together. So now I have a four carbon compound that's called as acetoacetyl sitting on the ACP end. Now everything is going to happen on the ACP end. So the acyl carrier protein is going to hold the four carbon compound that's called as acetoacetyl group. One carbon dioxide is being released over here. This step is being catalyzed by an enzyme called as beta ketoacyl ACP synthase. So it's all now going to happen on the ACP end and this enzyme is also called as the condensing enzyme. Why? Because it has taken two different molecules, two different precursors and condensed them together. So the condensing enzyme helps us to get a four carbon molecule on the ACP end that is the acetoacetyl group. Now there's no more addition of carbon for the next few steps. You're just going to have change in the particular structure. So as you can see over here, this is the carbon group that we have now. This this what you see over here is the carbon group. Now in the acyl chain, so this chain is called as an acyl chain. Now in this acyl chain, you are having, you know, you have the keto group. But then I don't want a beta ketone. So what is the beta ketone? See, so you can see over here, this what is next to ACP? Okay, this, this is the first ketone group. So it is the alpha ketone. This is the beta ketone. I don't need this. I, I don't want that, you know, C double bond over there to be present. I need to convert it. I need to move it and make it into a saturated fatty acid. Remember, we are making a saturated fatty acid. So now the all the focus will be on removing the double bonds and making it into a chain, a acyl chain with just single bonds in them or a completely saturated acyl chain. That, that is what the focus is going to be on. So at the end of condensation, our cysteine group, yes, is sitting with the sulfhydryl group, cysteine, whereas the ACP end is now having the four carbon acetoacetyl group. Next step, we have reduction. What happens in reduction? So nothing is happening to the cysteine end. We are not adding any carbon dioxide. We're just going to play around with the acetoacetyl group. So please, See over here, please, you know, uh, bring your attention over here. This beta ketone, okay, the beta ketone now needs to be converted into a saturated acyl group, right? So the beta ketone is where the attack happens first. The ketone group is being converted into a hydroxyl group, like you can see over here. So the conversion of B, the ketone into hydroxyl group is essentially a reduction reaction. So you are having reduction of acetoacetyl group, okay, reduction of the acetoacetyl group to 
what we call as the beta hydroxybutyryl group so now what i have over here is beta hydroxybutyryl acp that's the molecule name what have i done over there i have reduced the keto group keto group is the c double bond o group into a hydroxyl group so i have done the reduction reaction over here now in this process if this molecule is getting reduced something else has to get oxidized so the molecule that gets oxidized over here is nadph as you can see nadph is getting oxidized to form nadp plus so you have this you know very nice conversion over there nadph i had already formed in the beginning now nadph is helping me out it is getting oxidized and in the process you are having reduction of the c double bond o into coh now this is a reaction so the uh, reaction is called as either reduction or you know you can call it as a oxidation reduction reaction but the enzyme involved over here is beta ketoacyl acp reductase so beta ketoacyl acp reductase gives me beta hydroxybutyryl acp this is the molecule that i'm going to get over there now in the next step we have dehydration so if you remember what is the name of the step you will be automatically able to tell what is happening in the reaction now in dehydration i have loss of a water molecule so now this is the molecule i have beta hydroxybutyryl is what is attached to the acp end now this molecule is going to lose its uh, you know oh or hydroxyl group in the form of water so water is getting lost over here the enzyme name is dehydratase beta hydroxyacyl acp dehydratase it loses the water molecule and now because it has lost the water which was attached over here now there's a double bond that is being formed between the two carbons so this molecule what we have over here is called as crotonin so now from beta hydroxybutyryl acp i get crotonin acp so the same four carbon atoms it's just that we are playing around with the functional groups so the crotonin molecule is having an enol group what what is the you know the enol group that is present over here this is the enol group this this part you know this is the enol group now i need to remove that enol group and make it saturated so i don't want any double bonds at all over there so what happens is the crotonyl acp is now going to again go through one more round of reduction and remember when the molecule is getting reduced something else is getting oxidized and what is getting oxidized NADPH so NADPH gets oxidized to form NADP plus and this molecule that is crotonyl ACP gets reduced to form butyryl ACP so you can see over here I just have this alpha keto group that's present rest of the carbon atoms have all been straightened out they have all been you know just splattered with a lot of hydrides and now they're saturated with hydrogen and i have only single bonds over there so this enol group is basically being converted or it is being reduced to form a you know saturated acyl chain so the enzyme that's involved over here is enol acp reductase enol group is the one which we are acting upon attached to the acp and it's undergoing reduction so it's acp reductase now i have a four carbon chain now this is my acyl chain which we call as the butyryl group because it is having four carbon atoms attached to it now after this what happens is that the same steps are going to be the what we have seen till here is what i have shown or what i have put up over here that is you have the you know the uh, molecule the fa is getting charged with or activated with acetyl coa and with malonyl coa and then you have each of the processes of condensation reduction dehydration and again one more round of reduction these four steps now keep getting repeated so what we have now is this this is what i have now that is the cysteine group is having a sulfhydryl group acp is having a butyryl group and this is what i'm having now now from here same process that started initially so first before we go for condensation the butyryl group is going to get shifted on to the cysteine end so it is getting transferred on to the cysteine end remember the enzyme that was involved over there was acyl transacylase so transfers the fatty acid that is being formed to the cysteine end now that ensures that the acp end is free free for what free to take the malonyl coa so malonyl is now going to get loaded or it is going to you know add get added on to the acp and acp is binding on to the malonyl coa and now we have repetition of 
the four steps that I said, which is the condensation. So now the butyl butyl end is going to come and get condensed over here. In the process, one molecule of carbon dioxide is going to be released. So malonyl had three carbon atoms. Butyl had two carbon atoms. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, four carbon atoms. But then I lost one carbon dioxide. So ultimately now I'll have a six carbon chain, a acyl chain that is attached over here at the ACP end. I'll have a six carbon chain. Now from there it has to be reduced. Then it has the one molecule of water has to be removed by the enzyme dehydratase undergoes one more round of reduction to give me hexanoyl. So I now have a six carbon acyl chain over there. That is the hexanoyl compound. So in this manner, we have multiple rounds of repetitions that have to take place for me to form a 16 carbon chain. So I just had four over here. This was a four carbon compound. Here, after you know condensing this, I got a six carbon. In this manner, I have to go for multiple rounds for me to get a 16 carbon compound over there. 16 carbon is the palmitic acid. So for palmitate to be formed, I initially had palmitate is having 16 carbons in it. My first round, we have added four. That is a butyryl uh, ACP. So four carbons have been added, which means I now have 12 carbons more to be added. If every step is adding only two carbons, so you can see over here from butyryl when it gets added onto malonyl, you have one carbon dioxide being released. So at every step, I have only two being added over there. So 12 divided by two, I need six more rounds to complete uh, an entire molecule of palmitic acid. So six rounds plus one round totally, I need seven rounds. The cell has to run seven rounds of these steps. That is condensation, reduction, dehydration and reduction to form one molecule of palmitic acid. What you see over here is the entire process. Like I said, we first got our, you know, the citrate shuttle. Then we formed the malonyl CoA. From the malonyl CoA, we formed, started forming the palmitic acid with the help of our two precursors, malonyl group, malonyl ACP and acetyl ACP. And then through the repeated processes, we finally get a palmitic acid or palmitate. Now, one more step is involved over here. That is the termination. So our fatty acid is still attached to the ACP end of the enzyme, of the fatty acid synthase enzyme, the FAS enzyme. We can't have it attached to the enzyme. We need to cleave it from there. So the enzyme which cleaves it from the end, from the FAS enzyme is called as thioesterase. Thioesterase sort of releases or cleaves the fatty acid chain from the FAS or from the ACP acyl carrier protein and gives you the final fatty acid. So thioesterase is the last enzyme that you shouldn't forget to write about when we talk about the fatty acid synthesis. Now, after this is done, after the fatty acid synthesis is done, then we have elongation. So from 16 carbons, if I want a longer chain or in, you know, in, in some cases uh, that usually happens in the endoplasmic reticulum where, you know, elongases are the enzyme which use malonyl group, same malonyl group only is being added, but again, only two, two carbons are being added every step. So elongation is one thing that can occur from palmitic acid or desaturation, which means if I want to form unsaturated fatty acids, then again, desaturation is, you know, is something that occurs where double bonds are being introduced. So they are introduced either at the ninth position, sixth position, fifth position. And that, for that, again, we use palmitic acid or the saturated fatty acid is what is being utilized. So once the saturated fatty acid is formed, then the cell decides what it needs and eventually sends it for either elongation or desaturation. This was a brief overview of the fatty acid synthesis, especially the palmitic acid synthesis. Now, one thing to remember here is that this happens in the cytoplasm or it can occur in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. If it's a plant cell, it occurs in the chloroplast. What are the main enzymes we need over here? The first one is the ACC enzyme. ACC stands for acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Why? Because that decides whether the cell is going to get committed to the fatty acid synthesis or not. And then we have the fatty acid synthase enzyme, which is a big enzyme complex that comprises of seven enzymes and a carrier protein, which we call as the acyl carrier protein. Along with this, we need the precursors. Those are acetyl-CoA, malonyl-CoA and NADPH. Together, all of these help us to form the palmitic acid in the cytoplasm of the cell. I hope this video was useful to all of you and see you all in the next one as well. Bye.